before I start my own um, interview with you, I'm just going to quickly catch up on what some people have said um, in, in the chat about Black consciousness. So Denzel said, Black consciousness is an awakening of the Black mind, an appreciation for Black intellectual thought, and a dismantling of the colonial depreciation of Black thought. I hope you would um, find, find in that, um, Professor, something in alignment with what you've just said. I, I, I certainly do. For those says, I understand Black consciousness as being the philosophy that underpins self-actualization for Black people and champions thoughts outside of colonial structures. I work in embodiment and I'm trying to understand the ways Black consciousness applies to practices that link mind and body. Um, and uh, Denzel also added, Professor Pityana's point on the attraction by the younger generation is a very important point for the South African context. This is a deep appreciation and there is a deep appreciation and attachment towards Biko's ideas because it pushes the intellectual boundaries and offers a reawakening of the black intellectual mind. And I think what you said, Professor, about um, you know, Biko being so young at the time that he formulated these ideas and um, in your chapter you speak so much about the reappropriation or the rediscovery of his work by young South Africans today. Um, so I just have a few few questions to, to kick things off and um, some of them will be from the, the chapter itself and some of them but I, I think they're just ideas that will are, are part of your thought anyway so hopefully they will be familiar and then I have some some questions based on what you've said um, today. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask, let me just pull this up. Um, if one of the principal aims of SASO was to boost up the morale of the non-white students to heighten their own confidence in themselves, which was part of point number six, I, I believe in, in the main aims, then a principal aim of black consciousness is surely to boost up the morale of Africans to heighten their own confidence in themselves. So my question, my first question to you, Professor, is, in your opinion, are Africans today confident in themselves? Thank you. Are you, I thought you were going to do two or three. Oh, sorry, that's just, these are just my questions. I mean, when we get to the, um, <laughs> to okay. everybody. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, yes, it is. There's a, there's a certain level at which Sasso um, uh, was important to give confidence to the black students in a segregated campuses in which they lived in. And that were considered second class uh, people, second class education system. Uh, to anything else that was available for white people. But what was important for Sasu was to help those black people not so much to have confidence um, in order to aspire to become like white people, in order to aspire to become like the universities and other universities that claim for themselves levels of value that, was, uh, that were higher than anything else, was not to do that but to get confidence in their own capacity, in their own humanity, to actually with an intellectual capacity that would enable them um, to become very strong intellectual and brilliant forces in the science world, in the knowledge world in our country. And that, that evolved, that idea evolved in black consciousness actually from um, the only original thing to say, oh, we, we, don't, we don't like where we are, our universities is pushed. It wasn't so much to say that our universities were the best because they were not, but it was to say, it doesn't matter where we are. We have a responsibility to affirm and to, and to claim our intellectual capacity uh, and to become the best that there, there is and what exists. The second thing, talking about Africa now, um, uh, we've, we've moved a long way in Africa, but if you look at the continent at the moment, um, and I, I think of the days not so long ago um, of President Beki, of uh, President 
uh, Obasanjo and President Wad, etc. Things are slightly different right now. It's just amazing that uh, the conflict between Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia over the dam uh, is indicative of something about being African as a, as a pan-Africanist ideal uh, seem to be dissipating. Secondly, in Ethiopia itself right now, uh, the conflict in Tigray um, and where it seems, and so the government wishes us to believe, that it is the whole of Ethiopia against this region called Tigray. And the government is now inviting um, uh, Ethiopians to arm themselves and to join the forces to fight Tigray. That's a very, very difficult, different idea of Africa. I, I'm not, I'm, I deliberately am not saying America, Britain, Europe. I'm talking about Africa and Africans among ourselves. And, and that is actually very, very key, very, very important for us to understand. But today, and this is, this is what I called enigma. That is why I ended with that question, Apeke. Um, South Africans today, I often say, there is a missing factor, uh, certainly in our country in South Africa, but if I may say so, elsewhere in the continent as well. There is a missing factor. The missing factor is that Pan-African ideal, that Black consciousness ideal, that idea that uh, as, as Black people, as African people, we owe it to ourselves and to each other to shape and form the community and the countries and the lands that we want and which are important for the renewal and the renaissance of our continent and our ideas. And I think, I think in, in, in talking about South Africa at the moment, I could talk about uh, Mozambique, uh, where there are all kinds of internal wars uh, uh, taking place today. If I can talk about South Africa right now, I think that, uh, some, I think Archbishop Tutu said, we need a good dose of black consciousness from our government to get to love being black to love black uh, thinking and black ideas and black intellectual thought, to get to be committed to the advancement of black people and black communities, because the vast majority of the unemployed and the, uh, the poor in our country are black people. You wouldn't think that we have got a government that is, uh, uh, if you like, predominantly black government. So I have a feeling at times that we actually don't have a political system that enables the affirming of blackness. The places that are underdeveloped in our country are places where, where black people live, the homes and the uh, environment, et cetera, where black people live are the neglected parts of our country in South Africa. And then you say to yourself, but, but where is the love of blackness? Where is the love of being black that is taking place in our country? So are blacks today confident? I doubt it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for a wonderful, wonderful explanation um, of, that, of that idea. I wanted to um, go on now and talk a little bit about um, economic policy. You write in the chapter, and you've alluded to it a little bit today, that there is a that central to Black consciousness is the need for radical economic transformation. However, you credit the renewed interest in Black consciousness to the what you say is the paucity of intellectual thought in modern day South Africa. What are your thoughts on the economic policies of men and organizations such as Malima? Nglozi and the EFF, what is your thought, what in your opinion is their thought lacking in intellectual weight? I have to confess first of all that I, I, I don't know that I understand the economic policy of the EFF, <laughs> such as it is. Um, you know, the important thing about economics and economic policy is as, as much as possible to avoid being reactive. 
And we cannot and should not simply be defined by the past and where we were in the past. We cannot define our policy today simply in terms of that past. I think we need to be able to say positively, what is it about what there is today that can, that can be so structured and organized and transformed and reorganized for the betterment of the people of the country? What is it that those who have been caused to be better as a result of the history and all that, what is it that they have to give in order to be able to uplift those who are poorest among us? I find that missing in our country by and large in economic, economic policy tends to be to say, let me get as much as what I can get because I belong to the elite uh, classes and we'll try to bring up with a, whatever left will bring up the poor. Because it never happens. Because actually it's not sacrificial. If it's, if it's not sacrificial because actually it is devoid of intellectual commitment. It is, it is showmanship, it is theater. And I think that what we really need in South Africa is a, is a, is a major overhaul of an economic system that was designed and founded to meet the needs of the few uh, white people. But even today, it meets the needs of the few with some black people, elite like us, who are beneficiaries of it. We don't have an economic policy that actually takes account of the fact that the vast majority of the people of our country are not net beneficiaries of our system. No political party in our country uh, gives me confidence enough to say that actually as a result of their being in government, we are likely to see major changes and transformation. Now, the big thing of the EFF is land. What does it say? It says land must be owned by the state. I've never seen anything more regressive than that. It's like Bandustans, like chiefs and traditional leaders. For me, I have no reason to trust the state to act in my interests necessarily on a matter of land. And therefore, if, if South Africans by and large, they don't trust the state, they don't trust government. By and large, South Africans feel that uh, what is important is to be able to, to earn and have the resources that are enabling themselves to, for the wealth of the land to be shared uh, equitably so that those who have nothing can have better. So I, my own feeling that I don't have confidence in what I know of the EFSF economic policy, Frankly, from what I see, not the, not the South African Communist Party, not the African National Congress, from where I sit, I don't see anybody who takes seriously, seriously the concerns to actually make South Africa a more egalitarian society. Thank you so much. One of the things that I've always enjoyed about um, Biko's analysis was looking at the disparities in living conditions in South Africa and, you know, really stating that as, as a human rights abuse in and of itself, the, the dichotomies in how um, people live according to race. So I know that it's, it's something that's so central in, in, in thought um, in Black consciousness theory. I wanted to move on a little bit now um, to talk a little bit about Black consciousness as a pedagogy. So if, if Black consciousness is a pedagogy of the oppressed, so a system of knowledge acquisition in which the aim is to know more about yourself, where should that education be taking place? Is this primarily a question for the institution of the family, the community, the church, the academy? And if it is the last one, in your opinion, which institutions on the continent or in the diaspora are delivering decolonized consciousness infused curricula that would meet your standards for nurturing the next generation of Pan-Africans? Hmm. You know, the Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the press was actually very key to the thinking of black consciousness. 
it was key because of its psychosocial enablement, not, not conditioning, the psychosocial understanding who we are as reflective of and reflecting where we are and the relationships that we form and we shape together. And um, it was very, very important in enabling people as we got involved using the Paula Freire method in reading and writing with, with base communities uh, in the poor areas of our society. The biggest, well, one of the biggest challenges we have in the country, it's not the only one, one of the biggest challenges we have in South Africa at the moment is education. It is education because it is a system of education that produces de-education. In other words, it takes away from what people know and what their communities actually know. It seeks to make them uh, 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 less than who they are as human beings. In other words, in, other words, in terms of black consciousness, uh, philosophy and theory, it undermines their own humanity in many ways. Now that's a very, very uh, serious indictment uh, to make on the education system. A lot of it, um, we live in a society that has become hugely individualized, very materialistic, um, very much about the, the sort of bling and people want the latest this and latest that. People want to acquire, acquisition, acquire more and more for ourselves. We seem, what this has done, we've taken away from education. One of Paula Freire's big issues is education for development. We've taken away the idea that education should enable self-development. Um, <clears throat> to enable people must be the, their own, their own agents of, de of development. If you, if you look today with the education from the earlier systems, you go to schools, why is it that whenever there's a, a, a strife or conflict or anger of some sort, I've often been intrigued. Why is it that people, one of the first places that they burn are schools? Why do we burn our schools? Why do we burn the places where our children go for education? I don't claim to speak on behalf of the Asanis, but I do think that there is a sense of alienation that um, institutions of education in our country represent something other than the communities and the places where they are. So you don't have a situation where people actually believe that the schools that we have belong to us. They are places that the government has actually brought in here and put here. They, they employ the teachers and all of that. And equally, what is being taught is not necessarily reflective of the community and the culture and the upbringing of where the people have been. We say this in, 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 at one level is about mother tongue teaching. Uh, <clears throat> One of the essential tools of self-actualization is for children to learn, especially in their first five years of schooling, in their mother tongue. Uh, <clears throat> because of apartheid, because remarkably, you know, that's what, that's what apartheid taught. Apartheid taught us that we must have the primary school uh, uh, language of instruction would be, would be mother tongue. They're doing it for their own reasons. But now we're beginning to understand that it is so important that education in mother tongue is a very, very important factor in, in deepening awareness of self and of community and of, self, uh, of, of, of the environment and of history that, um, that Black people in South Africa, of course, with diverse people, white people as well, uh, <clears throat> would appreciate, come to appreciate and understand. So I think that I've often uh, said that it is so critical that we revive the idea of education for development once again. And schools in every community should become centers of development. 
should be places where communities are enabled to grow and to benefit from what the school, we have schools in South Africa that are open from eight o'clock to two o'clock. Can you believe it? And for the rest, and they are closed for, for, for five months in a year, shut closed, schools shut for five months. And people pass around the place, they need um, uh, the, the ground and the sports fields and all of that. The this, this school we have created out of the school property, an imposition on the community because it's not part of what the community. So it's not there for their development, it's not there for the community's learning, it's not even the pride of the community. So for me, that is all um, critical in understanding the pedagogy of the oppressed that uh, Paula Freire taught. Thank you so much. And I'll, I had another question, but I want to add on a question just from that. Um, for Fanon, for example, the primary vehicle of esteem was the struggle. For Negritude, the primary vehicle of esteem was culture. For yourself, for Black consciousness, for Biko, what is the primary vehicle of esteem then? Thinking about a pedagogy, what would be the primary vehicle of esteem? So within that pedagogy for development or that education for development, what should be prioritized? The struggle, the history, the language, as you mentioned, what is that prime, what is the primary vehicle? No, you touched me in a, at a soft point about some of the languages that um, we emphasize in South Africa, at least today. The first one, you know, that word called struggle, I don't want to hear that word, I hate it. <laughs> because, because everything, once it is couched in struggle, it's, it's almost justifying anything and everything. And uh, people say, for example, I, I didn't fight in the struggle to become poor. So it devalues the idea of struggle, what it was about. It is as if the struggle was about becoming non-poor, as if, as if poverty was a value in itself. So, so struggle is, is, is a language that is used. The second one that um, is very, very much devalued inside of these heroes and heroines. We love to make heroes out of everything. We name every street, any, every corner, every building <clears throat> after, after the so-called heroes. And we, uh, we do that and almost a revisionist in how historically we explain them. Uh, wherever you go, you find the so-called heroes of, we well, invariably only part heroes in, in the, in the, in the understanding of the entirety of the society in which we live in, um, selective heroes. So the second thing we always talk about is, is about heroes and heroines. I mean, just now we've had the so-called march to the Union buildings 1956, and we call that Women's Day. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 21st of March was the Sharpville massacre, we call it uh, Human Rights Day. So we live with this idea of heroes uh, and heroines uh, all the time. And it does seem to me that as far as black consciousness is concerned, my, my, my firm belief that what was, what was, what was if you like, the, the idea of esteem was blackness itself, was the idea of blackness. In other words, because we believe that blackness cannot be interpreted away from you, cannot be explained away from you, cannot be taken away from you. Blackness, it becomes a, a defining existential understanding that defines who you are. And the self, it defines your esteem and your vision and who you are. And because in owning blackness, we own our very being as well. So, so for me, for me, it has always been the case that blackness was a, a key instrument um, of identity, not in the narrow sense of exclusionary sense, but in the sense that I mean, still uh, makes, makes this point in the trial. It's not necessarily exclusionary, 
but it's analytic. It's about enabling me um, to define my life world, my life circumstances, uh, and what those life circumstances make possible and what they define for me and how they define who, who I am. So for me, and I think for, for, for black consciousness thinking, it will be defined in, in blackness. Thank you so much. Um, Nigel and I always go back and forth about the, the ability of blackness to hold so much. Uh, I think, I think um, with such an esteemed person on my side as you, I think I'm winning the argument. Um, well, you know, <laughs> I could bring one or two of my own, so. Excuse me, excuse me now. I'm doing the questions today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so. Um, this is one, going to be one of my last questions before we move on to the Q&A and the questions are coming in already. So um, in our conversation with Dr. Ampia earlier in this series, we discussed the work of philosopher Kwame Appia and particularly his belief in the need to decenter race in Pan-African discourse and action. And I think you're, this is sort of an extension from your previous um, answer. One of the principal features of Black consciousness, once prominently reflected in Sasso policy, is a rejection of non-racialism and the decoupling of white liberals and white liberalism from Black liberation, forgive me, struggles. What are your thoughts on the idea of relegating race in conversations on Pan-Africanism? Is it an exercise in futility or even worse, as a survivor of apartheid, do you take any offense in the suggestion that race shouldn't be at the heart of the conversation about the improvements of the lives of Africans? No, I think I, I oscillate in this. I, I can never have one, one, one position and my positions you know, change. I read Kwame, uh, uh, Anthony Kwame Apia, I read uh, Paul Gilroy, and uh, I'm here and I'm there. Um, so my, my starting point, I think, is the objective fact uh, of race and, and the meanings that have been attached to race, which need to be, if you like, um, re-understood and, and given new meanings than we have received and inherited. So, so race um, in a strange sort of way um, has become, if you like, a, a burden to many of us. I mean, Steve says very, very clearly that our understanding of blackness isn't, isn't just a question of color in the, in the narrow sense. Uh, blackness is actually a defining of a life condition of a people. But even given that, I, I, I live in South Africa, of course, and uh, I'm so conscious um, in our country of how with all the efforts of trying to decenter race, it, it's stubborn. Um, it, is, it is almost impossible. And you'll have to live in another planet, I think. Because in order for, for one to be meaningful in that, you've got to find um, communities and, and ideas and narratives that actually are living and operating outside of the race culture race factor. Now, because I live in South Africa, maybe if I lived in another part of Africa, it might not be so much. But because I live in South Africa, I, I, the pursuit of our constitution, of being a, 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 a nation of many cultures and languages and all of that, that's ideal. But I reckon it's impossible um, to deny the race factor in a country like this. We can, we, can, we can undermine it and seek to undermine it as much as possible, but we can't say that it is non-existent because it is real. It is a factor, 
it affects real lives of real people. 